evening, everyone. Welcome to Straight Talk for tonight's online community forum. I'm Pam Duncan. I'm the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council, and I am joined by my wonderful sidekick here, Amanda Westbrook, who will serve as the facilitator for our discussion. Amanda. Well, right back at you, Ms. Sidekick. Thank you. Tonight's conversation is the 33rd in a series of discussions started last year. Can you believe that? We do hold weekly discussions around important topics impacting our community in Tacoma and Pierce County. Tonight, we have invited a panel of community activists from the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness to talk about homelessness during this COVID winter. The most important message throughout this entire series of conversations is that there is hope for our community. Indeed, there is, Pam. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is being conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lashootseed language. Throughout today's conversation, you can submit questions to be addressed by our speakers using the question and answer function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will have time to consider every question, but we will make our best effort to get to the list in our allotted time. Now, I'd like to introduce our guests for tonight's discussion. Garrett Nyland, Director of Operations for the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. Welcome, Garrett. Kevin Glacken Coley, Director of Special Projects for the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Amanda and Pam. Maureen Howard, in the sunshine over there in the water. Yes, Consultant and Senior Policy Analyst for the Coalition. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you. And rounding out, last but certainly not least, in that fabulous hat, Colin DeForest, consultant and manager of the Safe Parking Network. Thank you to all of you for being here tonight and taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. So to get started uh, in this evening, let's hear how everyone is feeling. And when I say, how are you feeling? I really mean, how is your heart? How are you doing? And I'll let you jump in as your heart sees fit. I'm gonna jump in then because you mentioned hope and I am hopeful today because my left arm hurts because yesterday I got my first dose of a vaccine for COVID-19. So I feel like the light at the end of the tunnel is growing nearer. Congratulations, that's good news. I'm feeling hopeful, one, just for the, the people who are at work on this issue and uh, my hopes that we can come to some creative solutions. And two, that I actually was diagnosed with COVID at the beginning of the month and seem to be coming out at the other end and all I've lost so far is my sense of taste and smell. And there are those who would argue I had neither to begin with, so. Mm. Well, Kevin, much love and much healing to you. Thanks. Thank you for being here. I am feeling optimistic because I have had a full day of Zoom meetings, which is always just super rewarding. But what makes me optimistic is the people in every one of the Zoom meetings that I had brought something special to that meeting and made me feel where at times it feels like this battle is so very uphill. And um, after today, I really feel like opportunity is great and I'm so ready for the challenge. So, and, and I'm optimistic to have Pam and you put together opportunities like this just to talk. I think there's so much power in talk and just hashing it out and talking through it. So I'm very optimistic for that. Thank you, Colin. And I feel great. I had a good night's sleep. Summit's a week over and 
you know? <laughs> so, and I didn't have to be on back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. There were only, this is number five. It is truly the simple things like a good night's sleep that gives us hope, doesn't it, Maureen? Indeed. And Pam, I'm going to ask you to check in, my dear. Uh, how are you doing? It's everything that you've already heard, been on calls, uh, Zoom meetings all day long. I don't, I lose track, so I can't say whether it was five or seven or ten, but I am very optimistic, very hopeful. I have had an opportunity to work with or engage with every single person who's on this call. And um, these are the power hitters. So I'm really eager to hear what gets discussed this evening. Thanks, Amanda. You're welcome. And I would be remiss if I did not ask our tech guru who always keeps us in great shape. He writes the most amazing questions. Rob Huff, will you check in with us? Sure. Um, I am uh, optimistic as well, um, and I'll piggyback on what Kevin said, and no one has accused me of having great taste either, <laughs> so, um, so I feel like I'm in good company. There we go. So let's open with a high-level overview of what we know about the state of homelessness in Tacoma and Pierce County right now. And Garrett, I know that you are someone who frequently digs into the data. We, we call you the data guy because you do it so effortlessly and it just seems to just roll off you um, like you were meant to do it. What can you share with us about uh, the, what the data is telling us about Tacoma and Pierce County right now? Sure, I'll do a caveat at first, which is that we, you know, we're really struggling in the days of COVID-19 because so many of the places we, we've met people who are starting new homeless episodes or who were experiencing homelessness um, are, have been unavailable. Our day centers, our libraries, right? So many of the places where, you know, people connected in. And so, so I only trust the data so much, but um, we look about the same as we did last year. We probably have around 6,000 people homeless and we see fewer people than a typical week becoming homeless now, but it's still substantial. Like the last week I have data on, which is the week that ended January 23rd, um, 70 people in Pierce County started a new homeless episode that had never been homeless before, right? So that that's not, and then a total of about 120 new episodes started. So about 50 people that had been homeless before um, kind of disappeared or found housing and became homeless again. Um, and so that's uh, often it's 200 people in a week. And so we're seeing fewer, but even in a time of eviction moratoriums, we're, we're still seeing people um, coming to us that we've not met before. And so I, I think we see visibly a lot of homelessness. Um, people are able to get into shelters. We have more shelters opening up now than we've ever had um, in Pierce County that I've seen. Like the pace, you know, is, is um, you know, really providing some options for people. But, uh, but I think what you're seeing outside is pretty indicative of how things really are. There's a lot of people, a lot of invisible people, right? We don't see families, but a quarter of the people experiencing homelessness are under the age of 18, right? So they are, they are well hidden by their families in cars or um, in sort of other circumstances. That's an, an incredibly intimate picture that you just painted when you say 70 more people or 70 more cases of homelessness showed up. So this is a question for all of you. How are things different with providing shelter during COVID-19 pandemic? That's the first question. And then of course, the second part that goes with it is our community doing enough? And you can jump in as you see fit. I would echo what Garrett had said in part of his uh, comments earlier is uh, what's different is how we're able to do shelter for people who are seeking it. Uh, day centers are, are not open or they have limited capacity. Overnight shelters, which would normally expand during winter months, particularly in inclement weather times, are not able to do that because of uh, social distancing requirements. Um, but also, as Garrett mentioned, there are a number of other options coming online. So the community is doing creative is finding creative ways to respond 
But I would argue that as long as there are people living on the street, we can't say our community is doing enough. And we certainly see people on the streets all the time. And then there are the folks you don't see, um, whether they're in their cars or out of sight. Um, so we're not doing enough yet. I think we're scrambling. I think if I were a shelter provider, um, and, and I've done that, um, not currently, but, I, but I've done that. And when the virus started, um, I don't think any of us really grasped uh, how, not only how long it would take to get vaccines and then how long it would take to get people vaccinated and that we wouldn't have a break. Mm -hmm. that the virus is like stronger and brighter and you know now we know it mutates and so everything we learned the first day was sort of about you know don't touch anything and then we learned it was transmitted in the air and I'm like okay how many of our facilities have actually had their HVAC systems looked at I mean if if this is is moving through the air, then it's incumbent on us to make sure that these buildings are not just safe because people are six feet apart inside, but that the air that's circulating is as safe as it can be. And just, I, and I think the other thing is there's, there's no break for the people who are trying to do the work and everybody can't do it anymore because if you've got underlying health conditions or if you are over, you know, 60 or if, you know, whatever it is, if you're in a multi-generational family, you can't risk bringing the virus home. And so, so individuals who have been working or, you know, as employees or as volunteers have had to make dramatic changes. Even if the jobs were still there, they might not be able to do them. Mm -hmm. Line supervisors, managers, all the way up to, you know, agency leadership has, have really had to rethink and they've had to think about how much risk could they take? I mean, CCS, moved folks into hotel rooms before they knew there was federal money. That was an incredible risk. And so I just, um, the fact that people are getting up every day and keeping these shelters going and the outreach teams going out, I, I just, uh, they're courageous beyond belief. Well said, Maureen. Yes, Colin. Um, I would I would echo what everyone else has said, and I would just say that I think this has forced us to think outside the box, maybe not necessarily in some of the ways that I'm guessing we'll talk about tonight, but it's forced us to think outside of our existing historical shelter system, which is CCS, TRM, um, Salvation Army, um, because of what Kevin and Maureen are talking about with, you know, social distancing requirements, right? So new people have been forced to step up, you know, the Vallejos, um, you know, Bellarmine High School, you know, I mean, uh, safe parking. So I think we're, we're thinking outside of the box, which I think is exciting. Um, being very involved with um, a family shelter for, for a while, I would say it's also extremely, it's, it's, it's scary times, as Maureen said, to be doing this work, right? Because there's not, I mean, we're working with the same tools that we had a year ago on some levels. There may be more for funding coming in through the CARES Act and such, but really what we know, if you were to talk to any of these people and ask them, were our shelters fully funded um, a year ago, two years ago, everyone would, would laugh and say, no, they weren't even halfway funded, right? So I think what this is doing is it's really shining the light on exactly the, the needs and the gaps within our system and exactly how spread thin our shelter system is and how how delicate it is and I think it's something that we don't look at a lot and it's because it's not it's not sexy it's not shiny we want there it's not the end answer but it is definitely a need so um yeah I, I think that's some of what I see um and it's scary I think at times when we start thinking about even you know any of the a lot of our shelters have had positive cases. It's amazing how long we went without having positive cases, I will be honest. Um, but you know, the process that's in, that's in place, and it's not just on a Pierce County level, but it's, 
it's not ideal. You know, I mean, we don't have a plan in place for shelters and responding and what happens with, if you're positive, where do you go if you're living in a, um, in TRM, you know, that's, that's a great question because we don't have great answers for that. So. Yeah, you bring up some really, really good points. Um, you know, all that a person has to do is to drive down Yakima Avenue uh, through downtown Tacoma to see that there's a real increase in visible homelessness right now. Kevin, what is, what is contributing to this? And do you have a sense that homelessness has increased or is it just more visible now? Thanks, Amanda. And I, I think the key word in, in that question is visible. Uh, Garrett mentioned earlier that our numbers are not significantly higher as, as far as we can track them because it's a little more difficult during COVID in the number of people who are homeless, but um, their options are less limited. So we had a number of encampments closed in the years leading up to, uh, to 2020, which brought people from under in, in forests or under highways and brought them out into the open. So we started seeing for the first time a number of encampments on sidewalks or rights of way. Uh, and I think now um, as we move into the winter months, again, our normal ability to expand our shelter capacity has been greatly impacted by COVID. And so there are not options for people to move indoors that are safe. Uh, and you know, one of the things we've asked coming out of our summit and uh, and others and a number of municipalities are, are putting into place is not is following CDC guidelines and not moving people from encampments when there's no place to move them to, uh, because that just disperses people into the community who have formed maybe a smaller community where they are and have a way of, of, of adapting uh, without then moving them out and then having to do contact tracing and everything else. So I, I don't think it means there's more people it just means that they're more visible to us, which has always been part of the thing about homelessness. And, 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 and even you know, if you look at what's happening on Yakima Avenue and in other places, it doesn't begin to address the number of folks who are living in cars. I had someone living in a, a couple living in a car outside of my house for the last two weeks um, because it's a quiet neighborhood and, and our neighbors were fine and, and, and we did some outreach with them. But th that's happening all throughout the town. There are people staying in their cars and we don't know that. So, no, yeah. no, yeah, thank you for that, Kevin. You know, Kevin, you mentioned the summit. So, Maureen, you were behind the creation of the two uh, recent uh, safe uh, shelter summits in December and also in January. Can you talk about what led you to hold the summits and what is the work that's happening now as a result of it? Well, first of all, I got to thank everybody here um, because the summits didn't just happen. Uh, late on a Sunday night after Patrick was shot and killed at 6 a.m. by a man who was housed, who was angry that there were people who were not housed living in tents on the public parking strip in front of his house. And he and his um, friend who had a bat of some sort um, came out and the friend began beating on two women who were in a tent and, um, and Patrick was ultimately shot and killed. And that was more than I could bear. And so that Sunday night, I just sat and I wrote an email to Mayor Woodards. And I just said, you know, this, this is a new horrible kind of violence in our community that we have to end. We, we cannot have housed people murdering people who are not in housing. And I asked her to um, step forward. I asked her to, to uh, partner with the county executive. And I didn't hear anything back. And um, I thought, well, you know, went into the mailbox. And just when I'd about given up, uh, I got a phone call. And... I didn't recognize the number, so I didn't answer it. Uh, so, but eventually we did talk and, and uh, she said, I will, I think you're right. And I will partner with the coalition. And so from that point, um, you know, I just took it to the coalition and said, look, 
I, you know, we got to do this. This is an opportunity. And, um, you know, will you all come along? And everybody said yes. And so I started with a list of requests that I thought were, were not able to be accomplished immediately, but they were things that needed to change. And it wasn't just about more shelter beds. It was about everything from how do we have trash picked up in every encampment across this entire county? How do we have hygiene stations every place we have people living in encampments? How do we have, how do we get people into safe parking? How do we get people to come in and let us know what their needs are? Can we get street medics out there? Can we get all of law enforcement responding appropriately. I mean, just a laundry list. And then people started answer, uh, adding to it. And so the mayor said, well, you know, this is really great, Maureen, but you know, people can't make commitments as fast. And so we agreed there'd be a second summit and that gave people an opportunity to bring forward commitments. And what we learned in the interim, what I learned, um, two really important things. One was, it felt like there was new energy that people were talking about things just like Colin saying earlier about, you know, you're on a meeting and you, you know, it's something new and it gives you a spark that keeps you going. And it just felt like the whole group was moving that way. There were new players, sectors that had not publicly come out. And there were, want, there were people who um, wanted to do something and might not have known how to do it. And so, and systems. I mean, we ended up that the hospital discharge plan, not to discharge people experiencing homelessness to the streets from the hospital floors. I mean, that went all the way up through all of the levels of leadership at CHI Franciscan Virginia Mason in time to make a public statement. I mean, and multi-care as well, but, but to get through that whole other new system was really something. So I, I to me, it's just really hopeful. So that, that that's because of everybody here and everybody out there, you know? Well, and that's what you get for emailing the mayor, at, as she said, two o'clock in the morning. No, no, it wasn't that late. She did tell me not to have any more bright ideas. Yes. But then after the first summit went so well, she told me I could have all the bright ideas I wanted, so. Well, we're, we're counting on that. This is a question for all of you. Um, why, how do each of you wrap your arms around all those efforts that are being done uh, across the county to help people who are homeless and try to support so many good things moving forward? How do you do this? And before you answer this, I wanna let our audience know something. When we're talking about uh, the coalition to end homelessness, Kevin is a consultant and his contract is due to expire this spring. Maureen and Garrett and Colin are volunteers. They have day jobs. They do this because they're called to do it. So now that I put that out there, I do want you to answer, how do you wrap your arms around this in terms of, of all there is to do? And how do you try to support so many good things moving forward? And Colin, I'm gonna start with you. All right, I was hoping that I'd be first. Um, no, I think that's a that's a great question. I think it's you posed it in a way where I think it's so easy to get caught up in the weeds of of maybe what's not happening and where the gaps are. And oftentimes that's that's where my head goes. My head goes to Yakima Avenue a lot of times. Um, and but then you know I think it's important to transition out. And I think you know there there are a lot of amazing things. As I said earlier. There's, there's a lot of agencies, I'll say Vallejo again, that are coming out of the woodwork and are really positioning themselves to, three years ago, there wasn't a Vallejo. I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I don't, I don't think they were here three years ago. But now they're opening up. They're running a shelter. They're opening up. They're helping the city open up another one. Um, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of really exciting things like that going on. And I've, I, I think that's where, you know, coming, being away from the city of Tacoma for a few years, 
having some perspective, coming back and just seeing the, as Maureen touched on earlier, the energy that was here from being very involved in the coalition previously for the last decade and, and watching it go through some very serious ebbs and flows. And at times scratching our heads, wondering, is there a need for this anymore? And to see where the coalition, where Garrett, where Maureen, um, where Kevin have, have brought the coalition to now, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff, I think, that just energizes the, the community and really gives us the energy to move forward. And I really, truly feel like, you know, th like this panel that you have, there's the ability to lean on all of these individuals. On, I, I at least feel like I have that. And I know over the last year in the work that I've been doing, there's been many a time where I've leaned on all of these individuals and a lot of other individuals that are not not on this panel that are also power players within within this homeless services community. So I don't know, that's that's a lot of roundabout too. But um yeah, I that's how that's that's kind of what I see. How else do the rest of you keep yourselves going and moving forward? I guess I'll jump in. Luckily, there's a lot of really competent organizations and government agencies carrying a lot of the weight and doing it well, right? The city's been amazing at finding sites and, and establishing more shelter, you know? The county does a, a beautiful job of paying attention to best practices and making sure that the money that flows from the federal government and the state government to providers is, is effectively spent. It's a, a, you know, luck. I mean, there's still way more we need to do in the community and that's, and I think that we can get there. I think that if we understand the scope of the problem and really push to get the resources we need to meet, um, to meet, you know, the, the needs of our community. I mean, that's what keeps me going is the sense that it's doable. It's expensive. We need substantially more than we have currently coming in. But I don't think anybody's ever said, I want to know the scope of the problem. I am gonna take ownership of getting the resources to Pierce County so that we can effectively end homelessness. And I think that's what the coalition has decided to do. And that, that we may fail, but we are going to put all of our energy into making that happen. We are, gonna, we are going to take full accountability and try to get resourced so that the county and the city can do the amazing work they do funding programs and the providers can do the amazing work they do. Um, but somebody's paying attention to the need and bringing everybody in, right? The state, private funders, the federal government, everybody in to do enough so that homelessness is not damaging so many of our neighbors. Well said, Garrett, very well said. Kevin, um, you, I mean, you just divulged to us that, that you are recovering from COVID. I know you've gone through um, a job change. You have been in these trenches for as long as I have known you. Um, and that's been a good 25 years. How do you keep going? Well, and I've been in the trenches with Maureen for 35 once since I got to town. I, so there's, there's two things. One, there's a part of me that is despondent that we are here in 2021 and we're still talking about homelessness in our community. I remember when we, a group of us, Bill Bixell and others, started the Tacoma Catholic Worker back in the late 80s as a place to welcome folks coming off the streets. And there was an idealistic part of me that thought, well, we can solve this problem. Um, and it's gotten worse since the late 80s. Uh, what I've noticed in, this la in these three months that I've been working with the coalition though is the um, tremendous amount of goodwill and talent and commitment from so many, and Garrett highlighted that, organizations and individuals, whether they're private or public or uh, they work with an organization or they work on their own. Um, and we, we joke a little bit about being on Zoom all the time, but one of the positives, I think, of this new reality we're living in is it enables people to come together in ways that you couldn't do. Um, you can pull a group of people together for a meeting and really hash out something without ha all having to get in your car and drive somewhere. And so I've just been struck by the willingness of people to think outside the box and to try to 
not just do a short-term solution, but really look at the balancing that need for the short-term solution of somebody right now is experiencing homelessness and needs a place to sleep. What are the long-term solutions so that we move them from, from where they are now into shelter, into permanent housing? And how can we develop uh, those, um, those pipelines, as it were, so that people are being able to move into uh, stable housing and stay there? Um, and we have a lot of, I mean, it, it's not to be Pollyannish about it. Uh, we're, we're facing some difficulties that none of us envisioned before um, due to the pandemic, due to the number of folks who are, uh, who are at risk now of becoming homeless if we don't take some drastic steps moving forward. But I do think there is a, a group of people and talent and energy to respond to that. Well said. Speaking of, of uh, thinking outside the box, I, I do want to welcome, as we have um, somebody new in our discussion, um, County Councilwoman Jenny Hitchin of District 6. Thank you for being here and popping in. It's great to have you. You're welcome. Sorry I was a little late. I got the email and uh, I was like, oh, I wanted to hear this. And then you guys have sent me the invite right away. So it worked out really well. Well, thank you for being here. So here's a question that I think that all of you can answer. And um, I want to stop, start with uh, Councilwoman first here. And my question is, as we, as we look at the services that are, are focused for homeless here in Tacoma, why are there so many services just for Tacoma? Because we are a part of Tacoma Pierce County. And then there's also areas that bleed into us. Um, and do you also see that beginning to shift? And Jenny, let's start with you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a hope. I hope that they're shifting. We need them in unincorporated and outer Pierce County. Um, and I think it's a disservice to the community that they aren't there. Um, I think my perspective, because I was, for those of you that don't know me, I, a couple months ago and last year I taught high school. So kind of a different pathway to get here today. Um, but I think about my students and how the programs that are there to keep them in the same school, wouldn't it be great if they could also be involved in all their parks and rec that they were doing, that they could go to the library that was near where they used to live if they become homeless, if there's a church they're involved with, if there's a scout troop. But if we take somebody from Roy or key peninsula or somewhere else in our community and we bring them to Tacoma because this is where we have excellent services, we've disconnected them from those community um, partners. And so it, it just doesn't help the situation. So I want to hope that that is actually the way that we are moving is that we are gonna work on getting our services out. Um, I believe that Tacoma um, as a city has been our, our, our success um, places. We, we have so many different organizations that have stepped up, um, many of you sitting right here on the screen. And um, I just, I really think that we need to work on branching out. Um, it's not Tacoma's job to solve homelessness for the entire county. So that's where I am as a county council person. I think that needs to be a t-shirt. T-shirt, And I'm going to ask Maureen to jump in on that in the sense of um, it does feel like that our services are Tacoma centric um, and that some of the outlying areas don't have them. What are your thoughts on that? Is it shifting? Well, no, I think it's shifting with very deliberate policy decisions that the uh, Pierce County and human services and uh, the city of Tacoma are making. And um, uh, evidence of that, things like the new 20 bed hotel-based shelter in Puyallup um, as a result of state money that gave you more money if eligible jurisdictions would agree to work together. And so the eligible jurisdictions did. And we got those 20 beds that are going to open in, in Puyallup. So, um, but I think historically, because I go back to the beginnings of the, um, shelter every night. So I created the Last Chance Shelter and opened it on October 1st, I think, of 1982. At that time, the uh, 
people who were seeking shelter were by and large single men who were riding the rails. It was deep unemployment, 10% official unemployment. And so unofficial was, you know, probably 40%. Um, and the, you know, train came through Tacoma, you know, people would get off, they'd sp spend whatever time and get back on and go somewhere else. So I think it was sort of natural that services and shelters began to evolve in Tacoma where, where you could easily um, acquire property. I mean, if you weren't here in the early 80s, you don't know how devastated that downtown was. And so you could pretty much, you know, get anything. Um, and then I think it's, you know, you have to have a certain thoughtfulness about is the, are the elected officials going to be willing to address issues that are this difficult and that do not appear to return on, have a, a, a good return on investment? Mm -hmm. And so I started arguing with the city council that for every hundred homeless, mentally ill people, we got back on SSI in the 80s when Reagan bumped them all off, that that was half, at that time, half a million new federal dollars into the city, into the private sector every year for as long as they lived. So that was the best return on investment they were gonna get. And the city agreed and paid for outreach workers. But I, I, you know, I think it's, it's, we didn't think we were gonna do this for more than the eighties. I mean, we really didn't. It, it was horrible to come back here and see that all across the country that not only had we not solved homelessness, but it was in many places far worse. And so it's, um, it, it's, I think it's just a normal evolution. I mean, no nonprofit that I know sat down in the eighties and said, well, I think we'll have, you know, programs in each district that has a county, you know, council member. I mean, <laughs> you just didn't do that. That's not what you were, planning on. I'm not even sure people did it in the 90s that much. You know, you sort of did expansion where you were most familiar with the, the territory. And I mean, these aren't franchises, you know. So yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, it's amazing to see the shelter open in Puyallup. Pam, what do you have on your mind right now? I really want to echo and reinforce what Maureen just said about um, that there wasn't this uh, farsightedness about um, homelessness, because just as Maureen just mentioned about what was going on in the 80s and 90s, I'm reminded about the, um, the decision to create housing first units in the community in early 2005 or six, and Colin can also jump in about this, but there were um, 100 units that were set aside for Housing First. And then after that, there wasn't any conversation about adding to those 100 units. So it, implicit in that thinking and that approach is the a sense that there won't be more than 100 units of housing first that will be needed in our community. And even at that time, let's just say what, 15, 16, 17 years ago, that was gross, a gross underestimate, underestimate and it's far more so now. The other thing that I want to add is that when for whatever um, that number of folks were around 2005, 2006, we had the, um, the recession happen. And really what we saw was everyone who was already homeless sink into the sediment, sink down with a new wave of folks who became homeless after the um, impacts of the recession, the great recession. And so we have folks who um, we've just lost sight of because we had this whole new wave of folks become homeless. And if we don't come up with a plan very quickly, we're gonna see it again. Well said, very well said. Garrett, my data guy, when you, when we started the top of the hour, you said, you know, 70 families new to homelessness 
Garrett, are you able to look at your data and, and decipher of those 70 families, how many of them are not in Pierce County are coming from um, outlying areas? Sure, we, yes, we ask two questions. Where did you sleep last night? And where were you most recently permanently housed? And with those two questions, we can see migration information. So we're looking at maybe 15% come from out of the county. And the vast majority of those are coming from King County and Lewis County. Um, and, well, no, Thurston, Thurston and King. And that makes sense. Like a lot of our boundaries don't make sense to people. Federal Way versus Northeast Tacoma, right? You know, Yelm's not Pierce County, but it's not far, you know what I mean? And so, and then we see maybe 7% or something like that, maybe a little bit more are coming from out of state. And those are often interesting, right? There may be soldiers um, that were previously stationed somewhere and moved um, from, you know, their, their last base in Texas back to their home in, in Tacoma only to find a job, not work out and end up homeless. Like each one, each one has a story that's not about we're an amazing place to be homeless. And so everybody's coming here. It's a story about an individual journey and how they ended up in Pierce County. Absolutely. Colin, I want to, I want to pick on you just for a bit here. Um, you are the forefront of the work uh, to create low barrier uh, safe parking net network across the county. We just heard that, you know, Kevin had um, some individuals living in their car in his neighborhood and they reached out. How is that effort going first off and where have, where have the lots been set up so far and, and where do you see this effort going? Right, yeah, thank you. Um, the Safe Parking Network is something that really was not on, Safe Parking was not on my radar. You know, like in the all the years that I've done homeless services work, Safe Parking is just something that I never really put much energy into. And I think that's one of the challenges and one of the the challenges to Safe Parking is just, it's, it's very invisible, right? So people that are living in their vehicles whether it's a family who's fleeing a domestic violence situation and their ultimate goal is to stay invisible because every single mom in every mind, it's if I get found in my car or if I get found in this tent with my kids, they're gonna take my kids away, right? So um, just by default, they're gonna do everything they can to not show up. And so, you know, when you talk to Garrett, they're, they're not showing up on that data, right? So we're not, we're not finding them in the point in time count. And that goes for individuals living in their vehicles too. Anybody who's done a point in time count, you've probably, and if you've trained anybody, you've come up with saying, hey, I think somebody's in that vehicle. Well, you really don't know. And oftentimes people in their vehicles, they may be rationalizing that they're, they're not homeless or they, they're not ready to really give into that or, you know, or they might be working, right? So really, up until we started the Safe Parking Network, was, which is just kind of something that came to, there's people from this group that really pushed it along. Jan Rumbeck really pushed it along from really a COVID standpoint of how are people in vehicles that potentially may have COVID, how are, how are we working with them? How are we managing that? How are we keeping them in one area? And we quickly found out, well, we're not because until the Safe Parking Network started, there was not one place, not one spot in Pierce County where you could safely park, not safely park an RV, which are a whole nother can of worms and a challenge within themselves, safely park a vehicle. So that goes for a mom with her children, that goes for a couple with their dog, that goes for an individual. There was not one place where you could safely park. So that, the more that I learned about it, the more I talked to Pam about it, the more that we talked to others about it. I think the, the thing that uh, the root of the Safe Parking Network, and not everyone agrees with this, but the ultimate goal of that and how we move forward with it was the understanding that we don't want people in vehicles. So our goal is to get people safely parked, stabilize those families and individuals, and get them out of those vehicles and into some form of housing as quickly as we possibly can, right? And that really has been the mission moving forward over the last six months. So what we've been doing is we've been working with we're open to working with anybody from a school to a nonprofit to a city to a county. Um, 
but really where, where we've been focusing is on faith-based organizations. So right now we have two sites that are open. Things are going great. Uh, we're working on multiple other sites. We're working with Bellarmine to try to come up with a site on their property, which is amazing for someone like Bellarmine to step up. We are working with TCC. I'm presenting to TCC's president later this week. Um, and their site will be specifically to serve their students. They're living out of their vehicles. They have around nine or 10 right now. So really the goal of this and so many of the programs that we talk about, I think, especially when you talk about outside of the city of Tacoma, and that's a big push of this. So one of our sites is in Puyallup, East Pierce County. The other, other one is in East Tacoma, but then we're looking at Lakewood. So we're, this is a program that really is probably the easiest to do what you were talking about earlier, because the infrastructure is small. You need a, you need a parking lot or maybe just a gravel lot, right? So it's doable to think that the Puyallup's, the Sumner's, the Lakewood's, the Yelm, or Yelm's outside there in Thurston, but the smaller cities can actually participate in this program. And that is the hope moving forward is that we can truly meet these individuals where they're at. So when you're homeless in Eatonville, you don't have to go to downtown Tacoma because in being the city manager for the city of Tacoma, I mean, not the city, the homeless services manager, sorry. It's very clear that by sending everybody, even though it's a good intention of centralizing those services, it's not good for those individuals. And it's also not good for the city of Tacoma. You know, we've all been involved in those conversations around how challenging it is for the city to respond to that need and how we need these others to step up. So hopefully through small pilot programs like the Safe Parking Network, we can show one, you know what, I have I have a, the site's five blocks down the road from my house. It's packed right now. So you know what that tells me? There's a need in Puyallup, right? And I think that's the goal. And then we'll have people like Garrett that can put that into some, some pretty graphs and then we'll be able to show that. And then when we talk to the city of Puyallup next year, that's a different conversation, so. Colin, very well said. Um, and and what, you, what you didn't say, but I'm gonna say it for you is that it also, helps other cities be accountable. We cannot be everything for every city. And that is not, that's a conversation we've had many, many times. But if you're gonna enable small cities to um, shirk their responsibilities when it comes to taking care of people who need a safe place to park, then you know, you're part of the problem at that point. Um, I want to ask this question of all of you, and this has to do with um, some of the services. Um, the City of Tacoma and the State Department of Transportation are scheduled to remove an encampment from uh, under the overpass down by I-5 tomorrow. It's been all across all of the dailies. What are some of your thoughts about this and the resources that are being made available to those who are currently living here? And I'll let anybody jump in. You mean the encampment that the city said had three people in it and <laughs> the uh, outreach folks said no and the News Tribune found more tense than that? I mean, I, I mean it's inexcusable. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I appreciate that I-5 needs its lane changed, but they have known that lane change was gonna happen since they started this program, I-5 transportation around here. So it's not like people didn't have enough time. What we didn't do is we didn't take seriously that the folks who were in these encampment, this particular encampment have a right to a safe and decent place to live. And we could have made that happen. Every one of those folks could be in a hotel room tonight, 100% covered by the US government through FEMA, through the changes that FEMA has made in the last month and that the city and the county are completely aware of. And so there, there is, are there other options? Certainly. But we also know that a man who tested positive last week for COVID came out of that encampment. So it's not like, people can be offered shelter in a congregate shelter because they could be carrying the virus or they could have been within the exposure period that the CDC gives us. What else could we have done? 
uh, there are empty buildings. We could have opened some of the empty buildings and offered people space inside with plenty of distance. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things we could have done. We, we could have gone down I-5 and bought 30 or 40 travel trailers and put people in them. I mean, we had choices that we chose not to even look at. And, and that's on all of us. That's on the city of Tacoma and that's on all of us. And that has to change. It absolutely has to change. And the, and the person who says, I mean, I learned from people experiencing homelessness in the eighties. And the man who eventually ran the last chance shelter, Joy Neal told me, he said, Maureen, when somebody tells you that the street is their choice, what they're really telling you is they have no choice. And before they'll tell you that, they'll say that this is where they wanna be. And we know there are people who can't maintain in a congregate shelter, we know that. But we also know that people really do want a safe and decent place to be. Maureen, I want you to say that one more time because that is a teaching moment. When, when homeless people tell you, now finish the sentence. That this, is, this street is my choice. What they are really saying is, I have no other choice. And before I tell you that, I, that I have no other choice, I will tell you that this street is my choice. Oh. And you will hear it all the time. And it's, I mean, we have to really listen to what people are telling us, not just what they're saying, what's yeah. behind what they're saying. Yeah. Beautifully said. Pam, I want, I want to talk with you about um, a question that came up in the chat about um, HB 1590. Sure. I, I just have to give um, first, um, I just have to say, Maureen, thank you for what you just expressed. Thank you for um, speaking truth. Thank you. And actually everyone on this call, that's part of the reason they are on it because they speak the truth. And I just want to say thank you. I, I really feel very strongly about that. So in the Q and A, a question was presented. What are your thoughts? And this is for everyone. What are your thoughts about House Bill 1590? And for the benefit of our audience and anyone who's not familiar with it, House Bill 1590 passed last year and it allows for jurisdictions to enact an additional sales tax that's specifically focused on housing, a portion of it must be used for um, mental health uh, related services and um, housing related services. But overall, the, the idea is that the city of Tacoma can enact this um, additional sales tax or the county. If the county enacts it, then the city um, must work with the county to receive those funds. So that's the question, uh, and that's sort of the background, if anyone wants to respond to that. So it's basically, would you put pay a penny on $10 to create countywide about $18 million, half of which per year, half of which could be bonded and be money almost immediately. Yeah. But at the county, it's, it's a councilmanic decision, thanks to Beth Dolio in the legislature last year, but at, in Pierce County, it's a supermajority because it's a tax. So that's five of the seven. Mm. And so um, the city is also um, moving forward and, and looking at this. King County did it um, late fall and a number of the smaller cities opted to do it themselves. But, um, you know, it's a resource for housing. Yeah. And, and I would say that um, having been involved in this work for the last 
three months in a new way after having been working in the food bank world for a number of years, there are a number of solutions available. And the one major stumbling block is funding for those solutions whether it's uh, placing people in hotels for, for inclement weather or for long-term since we can't do congregate shelter, or it's developing new uh, programs or new housing models, it always comes down to money. And as Maureen put it, a, a, a penny on a $10 purchase. Um, and I recognize it, it's on the sales tax and that's a regressive tax, but uh, until we as a state grapple with our, our tax base, that's our funding. Those are our funding options. Um, and it's also steady money that you can count on. Right now, there's all sorts of money that's becoming available in an in a alphabet soup way, but that's not money that's going to be available for the long term. It's for this crisis now. And this funding mechanism would give us a steady stream of money that could be used by people throughout the county to address the issues that we know lead people to be experiencing homelessness. So this coalition that we have here meets every week and for a long time uh, to find solutions across multiple service providers in Pierce County. Garrett, who can get involved in these coalition meetings and how can a person contribute to finding a solution to help people this winter? Well, the easiest thing is to come to a meeting and find someone that sparks your interest from knitting some socks to doing some fundraising for one of the nonprofits to working at a shelter with friends to cook meals to working on a single Christmas stocking project every Christmas to becoming a, a you know, advocate from your desk. For the, for the policy changes in the city and the county and the state that matter, there's, there's as many ways to make a difference as the, you know, as the skills and talents that you all out there have. And you can connect when, with Kevin and with Colin and with Maureen and with I, um, with me, I guess would be the right grammar. Um, and we're happy to walk you through you know, where your heart is and where, where the community could really use you. So the door is wide open. We are as big a tent as you can get. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to know that this is, this is our opportunity to serve our neighbors. And I'd read through the Good Samaritan story to you if I could, because I find that incredibly motivational. But, you know, these are the people that you know, it may be scary to think about helping them, um, but it's, I think it's where we all want to be. Garrett, you touched on something that, that laces into my next question when you mentioned the Good Samaritan story. And the question for all of you here, and, and definitely you, Councilwoman, is how do you stay motivated to try to solve these issues every week, every day, every month, every year, when this can seem incredibly overwhelming. So how do you avoid burnout? And I'll, I'll let all of you jump in when you feel you need to. Well, I've been doing this the longest. So um, I, I think we all have a touchstone. Garrett mentioned the Good Samaritan story. I think we, we each have our own. Um, I believe housing is a basic human right. And I believe the poor have the priority on our resources. I think you stay in this if you are not alone, that it's really important to love well. And if you are so fortunate as I am to be well loved, um, to have really good friends and colleagues and a wicked sense of humor. Wicked sense of humor goes a long way in life. For me, the answer always comes back down to community. Um, it's recognizing, 
nobody wants someone they love to be living on the street. Nobody would be comfortable with someone they love living on the street. But we other we other those people who are experiencing homelessness by whatever category can separate them from us, whether it's gender or race or nationality. Um, and so that we then don't have to think about them. It's their responsibility. And I, I find my hope from the people I've traveled with over the last 30 or 40 years that I've been in Tacoma, who are not content to accept the status quo, but are willing to try to find a new way to respond to that. And, um, and somehow I still have hope that we can get to that place. And that hope has been tested over the last few years, uh, I think on a national level in a way that it hasn't been. Um, but I, I, I still find people who are willing to start from the place that everyone deserves shelter and that we need to come together and whatever, and, and none of us has the whole answer. And so that's the other thing is I don't need to know everything. I just need to know what I can bring and, and then be open to being challenged to bring more the next day. Well said. Colin, what would you add to that? How, how do you stay motivated and, and not get burned out when you are searching for, for parking lots for people to feel safe in? You know, um, it's a great question. I, I wonder that oftentimes over the years, how I've been able to do that. And to me, it really just comes down. I just love humans, you know, and I was born and raised to understand that whether that was a person with no shoes on or the person with a suit on, they're just humans, they're just people. And my parents taught me to respect everyone the same. And so I do that. So what keeps me motivated is every time I drive down to Yakima Avenue and I see that, part of my motivation, one, I'm Irish, two, I, I find a way to take anger and use that to motivate me. And I'm extremely motivated right now. Um, so, you know, it's just not, it's unacceptable. and. Anybody who's been around, there's a lot of amazing things. So by no means am I trying to end on a sour note, but anybody who's been around has, has seen the amazing work that we've talked about today, but it's also Tacoma is in a, in a place from a visible street homelessness point where the fact that we're allowing people to live in the way that they do, it's, it's truly just makes me want to wake up earlier and work and figure out how we can do more for these people because it's just not right. You know, it's just not right. So that's, that motivates me. And also I have three young daughters and I teach them, you know, and so, so much of this is education, whether you're teaching kids or you're teaching adults, you know, I'm also teaching my parents and, you know, elders like that, that don't know and have, so that's the kind of stuff that motivates me. And then just getting to work with people like this, you know, I mean, how many people get to go home at the end of the day and they can say, maybe I didn't save a life, but I may, I change someone's life or I help someone or I listen to someone. And it's just very intrinsically powerful. You know, there's not a lot of people that can get that out of there. It comes with a lot of, a lot of stuff also, but it comes with a lot of power and I take it real seriously. So. Beautifully said. Council member um, Hitchin, you mentioned that you were a, a teacher before you began your political career. So you know about service above self and trying to avoid burnout. So what are you doing as you tackle this issue of homelessness? Excellent question and very important uh, in, in this day and age to make sure that we are doing a little self-care when it can get a little overwhelming or a lot overwhelming. Um, I, I'm not feeling overwhelmed yet in my new position, but I am, I'm drinking from a fire hose uh, has been the best way because I keep asking, I've, I've met with several of you already. And like, I keep asking, what do I need to know to be really good at this job? Um, and so I kind of have started thinking about what I did to not burn out as a teacher because my work ethic as a teacher was very similar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do really good. I'm gonna be amazing for these kids because I care. Um, and so I always had a thank you drawer where I had letters and cards from students and parents. And if I had a rough day, I would go pull one of those. Um, I had a thank you email folder so that if I was having a rough day, and I think I'm probably just going to continue that tradition just because I, I know I will have rough days and there's going to be days where I'm going to need a little kick in the butt or a reminder 
Why are you doing this work? Why is it so important that you are here and speaking up for um, people that don't have the privilege to do what I'm doing, uh, which is sit in an office and look out at the skyline and talk to some amazing people on Zoom. So um, thank you for all that you are doing for our community and inviting me so late. <laughs> Well, I, I think you now have some newfound uh, people who are going to keep you in the game. So uh, welcome to the family, as we say. I want to uh, give a quick note to our audience to say thank you for hanging in there with us. I know that we're um, a little bit over in our time and we only have two more questions. And then I know it's time to, for me to let you go and let you join your families. Um, there is a, a number of new direct action groups in the county that are taking steps like taking over buildings or collecting trash and leaving it in the front of City Hall to make a point about homelessness. So um, any of you can jump in here. How is the coalition working with these groups? And, and also, do you think constructive change can come from these kinds of activities and efforts? All right, I'll bite. Good. <laughs> Garrett's covered his eyes already. So I believe in direct action, all right? I go back to Vietnam, um, uh, the Iraq war, the first one, it, we, you know, I let a march, closed the access to I-5 in downtown Tacoma, it's powerful. Uh, my husband's been to prison, he's been in jail. Even in, as a State Department foreign service officer, I had a husband, who was in jail and we didn't know where he was, you know? So um, direct action is, has been part of our lives. And I think that it grows out of um, an urgency and a, a feeling that it's the only way you can be heard and that you have absolutely got to call attention to whatever it is that you are working on. And, um, that being said, I think it's um, the people that I learned from who had been community or were Catholic priests in the Midwest and the East who'd been community organizers back into the 60s um, and also San Francisco, but it, there was always a plan, a sort of a larger plan and the action was part of the plan. And I think that's um, really critical to be able to bring together the energy that direct action and the attention it can bring along with the um, experience, the day in and day out experience of the people who, who are part of that action. I mean, it, it can't be a people, it can't be an action that is led by somebody for somebody else. It's the somebody else's who lead the action. It's their action. And so, um, and, and whatever that is, whether it's people who are at the point of eviction or the people experiencing homelessness, whatever, it's their action. And I think that what we have to be able to do is recognize that we have all of these ways of trying to address homelessness and figure out a way that we're gonna marshal this energy together so that experience of the people who are most affected the energy of people who are willing to commit and the understanding of people who, who know structures and systems and how to change policies, that these pieces all weave together. And in the coalition, it, it, it's an open table, okay? We're not actually an organization, all right? So it's an open table and these are the rules that you are absolutely committed to ending homelessness and that you are respectful of everybody else. So, did I do all right, Garrett? <laughs> yes, Maureen, you did very nicely. It's like you, yeah, you, you have to push, right? But there's an edge at which pushing past damages things. And it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we as a community respond, perhaps simply do a much better job of providing services so the direct action isn't so necessary. But Garrett, I wanna point, point out that what Maureen is saying, if I heard her correctly, is that is an intrinsic part of the recipe of, of, 
of finding a solution to homelessness. So if that is how people express themselves when they feel like they have no other voice and it makes sense to put garbage on the city manager's lawn to them, Duke Poulsen just threw in a great note in the chat and he said, do these activities make it harder? Do they, Garrett? It's a great question. Some of the actions like, so I'm officially off script. <laughs> like when the takeover happened of a public building to help some homeless folks find a place to stay, my gut reaction was good for them. Like the public isn't open its unused spaces for these people to be safe, good for them. When they took over a private building um, that was owned by a business person, I felt, wow, that struck me as not okay. Like I had a very different reaction to it. And I, I, I'm new to this, much newer to that sort of direct action than lots of people here at the table. And, I've, and I felt like the, the end of that didn't feel like the right thing for the people experiencing homelessness. They felt less like the chess player in the game. And they seemed to me an awful lot more like the pawn in the game. And that that, that you know, that hit me really hard. And so we, we in the coalition work very hard to make sure that the voice of the people we're serving is our voice, they're on the coalition, right? They're, they're part of our decision-making. We have every opportunity to have them there. And if we can't get them where we need them to be to help make decisions, we go out and find them and ask the questions. And you know that, so that was a bunch of rambling there, but, but you know, the, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Seven, if I could Kevin, jump in for someone just a, save me. Yeah, so if I could just jump in for a second. So, you know, as a Catholic worker at heart, I mean, direct action was a large part of what we do uh, in, in terms of, you know, I've risked going to jail and I've gone to jail for actions uh, that I thought uh, had some merit to push the issue further. But I was in a place where I could take that risk and I wasn't putting somebody else at risk who had less power than I did in that moment. And so sometimes my concern is that the people with less power are being, as, as Garrett mentioned, being used as pawns in this and being put at greater risk. And I don't think that that's right. So direct action, yes. Direct action where you're willing to take the risk for yourself, yes. Highlight a cause, make you know, make make it known in a way that it wasn't done before. But don't make things worse for the people who are already disenfranchised in so many ways. Their choice, yes, their choice to take risks, and part of that is they have to understand the risk they're taking. I mean, I made a choice early on when I was a single mom that I wasn't going to take a direct action that was gonna put me in jail because I didn't have anybody to take care of my daughter. I mean, you, it's a deliberative kind of process that you go through. And I think you go through it collegially as well, you know, and, and we have got to go through it. Yeah. I wanna, I wanna segue into my last question to close out tonight's conversation. Um, can each of you uh, address the question of what are some simple steps uh, that we can all as neighbors and residents take to help those who are homeless this winter? I'm gonna jump in, have a conversation. Yes. I think that the, my favorite people in the community that reach out to me are the ones that say, you know, there's a homeless encampment down on the street by my apartment building. And I've been going down there and talking to them. And I've got a lot of questions about what we're doing to help them. How can I help them better? Like, I love those. And it started because there was a human being living in an apartment and there was a human being living on the, on the grass strip and they went and they got to know each other. And they, they, you know, so I think, yeah, everybody's a human. Let's just keep that, you know, and, uh, and every conversation I have with a person I enjoy for the most part. So yeah, I'd say have some conversations with people that maybe you wouldn't strike up a conversation with. Will they be asking you for things? Maybe, doubt it though. It'll probably be a good conversation. As I often say, everybody is someone's son or daughter. So remember that. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I would piggyback on what Garrett just said, that that's the starting place. The other thing is, is not to get so overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem that you do nothing. Mm. Uh, everybody has an ability to do, whether it's, and sometimes it may just be treating a human being as a human being. That's a powerful thing to do in terms of that conversation. Um, COVID times have made it harder for, I think, folks sometimes to reach out to strangers, but uh, reach out to organizations that are doing that work if you're not able to at this point. Um, and and uh, there's an old John Prine song um, that he, you know, hello in there, talking about seeing old ancient eyes and seeing people. And I say that's true with folks who are experiencing homelessness. There's a human being in there, recognize that and start from that place. What would you as a human being want to have happen in your community? Uh, and then and, and do the little bit you can and don't worry about what you can't. I'd say in addition, if you can, don't be afraid to learn new things. Don't be afraid to bump the edges of your comfort zone. One of the most difficult things I think for people of goodwill is to realize that not everyone has the advantages that they have even if they don't think they have a lot of advantages, if they're housed, they've got a huge advantage. And so not to be afraid. And I would just, I would echo what everyone else has said, you know, to me, it's fun. Find what you're comfortable with. What do you like to do? Do you want to make something? Do you want to give a blanket? Do you want to Get, have some cookies, get, you know, pass some cookies out. I think COVID has made it challenging at times, but I will tell you one of the things that I always do, um, I, I don't give stuff to people that are on corners. Sometimes I'll, you know, talk to them and say, if you want a burger, I'll meet you at McDonald's or wherever that is. Um, but I tell you what, just the power for me, I, what I always do, what I always give them is I give them my eyes and I give them my attention and I try to look them in the eyes and just smile at them. And to me, the reaction from that, what you get, because they don't, people don't do that to this group of people, right? They ignore them. Just eye contact, you know, is such a powerful thing. And a smile, smile is a pretty darn powerful thing. So, and it's, we can all do it. Some of us better than others, but yeah. And don't be afraid to bring the skills you have to try and help solve. I, I just had a meeting with people from the Episcopal faith community and I looked at them all and I finally, at the end of it, I said, you know what? I said, you're the pastors and you may not have this, but you've got people in this your congregations who are people of wealth, who understand wealth. What do we need? We need money for housing. You get people who understand money. So bring the skills you have, bring the money too, obviously, but, you know, bring those skills and because somebody is going to need them in some place in the group. Yes. Councilwoman, I'll let you have the last word before we say good night. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I think my one thing is just to find a way to engage um, and find a way to start, especially if you haven't done anything. Um, and it might be you don't feel comfortable talking to somebody who's homeless, but you can show up at a shelter and provide services. You can donate online. It's super easy nowadays. Um, and, and just find a way to, to do something because ignoring the problem doesn't make it go away. Um, and we have the opportunity to help somebody. And I think that's the part that I want to focus on. Um, just real quick, I was mentioning to um, Pamela before I jumped on this meeting, um, Pierce County Council has had a little bit of a change in this year. Um, and we had a retreat last week. And um, I was very excited that we actually put on our you know, what are the things that we are going to focus on and staff, what are you going to focus on and housing was on there. But homelessness was on as its own thing, which means that now shows the county, our staff and the executive that this is truly a priority. And I, I was really excited to see. And that and that that was the group that wasn't just the Democratic majority. It was not just the chair. It was the group um, who said that and put it on paper. So I am I am excited. Um, 
So keep advocating for one tenth of 1% because we are hearing you along with all the other organizations, but I, I think we're gonna be working pretty hard this year on trying to really make some changes because Pierce County has some work to do. Don't make us get 300 people on the phone again, okay? Because I was one of those and we'll do it again. Talk about direct action, it worked. Miss Pam Duncan, CEO of MDC and one of my favorite people, time for you to drive us home and tuck us in. I'm, I'm just going to say that one of the most real and profound statements that I heard was ignoring the problem doesn't make it go away. All right, two snaps to Councilwoman Jannie Hitchin. Thank you so much for saying that. Here's my heartfelt desire that everyone who we've talked about, that we get to see that day when they all get to be tucked in, in a nice warm home, in a nice warm bed. I believe that the most impactful thing we can do is recognize the humanity of everyone. And I love the, what I heard and what I was saying in the chat. Make that eye contact, say hello. It's not about a photo op. It's just about recognizing our fellow humans because that recognition will keep propelling us forward to do the things that need to be done for our entire community. And it's not those people, they are part of our community. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining. This was such a, mm, a great conversation. It was fascinating. It was compelling. Everybody stayed on the call. And we just want to uh, give our appreciation to our panelists again, to our fabulous moderator and our fabulous tech person in the background, Rob Huff. And to everyone who listened in, thank you so much. These calls are recorded, so you can always go back and listen to them. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. Yep, thanks everybody for being here.